عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. نحمده ونصلي على رسول النبي الكريم. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. الحمد لله رب العالمين. الرحمن الرحيم. مالك يوم الدين. إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين. إحدنا السراط المستقيم. سراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شأن حبيبه إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم بارك على سيدنا ولا على محمد تبي القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبصار وديائها وعلى آله وصحبه دائما أبدا سلاة وسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله. Uh, you know, we've been talking last, I guess, week and a half or so about the Mi'raj or the night journey of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And, you know, I guess last week I was a little disjointed in certain aspects of it. Uh, but there's certain concepts that need to be clear, you know, whenever we're talking about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, or, or, or the ones that he loves, you know. And this is a universal concept amongst the Muslims. So it doesn't matter what ideology someone claims to belong to. You know, whether it's Wahhabi, Salafi, Shia, you know, Rafzi, or various branches of, of everything, you know, the Obandi, Barayulwi, it doesn't matter who someone claims that they associate with. Everyone claims to accept Rasulullah as Khair Khalqillah. <coughs> The best creation of Allah. And when we say khayr khalqillah, there's no limits to that. You know, He is the best in everything. Because that's the way Allah SWT has created Him. You know? And this is something we've talked about before, but you know, just th this is a concept that needs to be ingrained within us. Every time we mention Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And, and if we're able to focus on that, it makes it easy to start distinguishing between, you know, contradictions when people say, yeah, I believe in him as khayr khalqillah, but he didn't know this. Or I believe in him as khayr khalqillah, but he didn't have this authority. You know, or they find fault within him. And so... If, if that's not ingrained with us, then we fall for those traps. And the reason I'm even having to mention this is if you start reading even translations of the Qur'an, and I'm going to get to this later, you know, you see where they've injected so many things that contradict that basic notion or that basic concept. You know, as I mentioned before, there are really 19 verses that mention this journey. First verse of Surah Bani Israel, which is Surah number 17, and the first 18 verses of Surah Najm, Surah number 53. <coughs> but in order to understand those verses, we have to understand a little bit about the journey itself. And so the basics of the journey is that, you know, again, we went through the background as to you know, the, the, the basic setting of the journey as to what had happened before he, Allah SWT called him for this. And so that night, Jibreel al-Islam comes. And he brings with him Barak. You know, or a Barak. And this is a special Barak. You know, Barak is an animal from paradise who's smaller than a horse, larger than a mule, has wings and moves at the speed of sight. You know, the word barak comes from bark. Bark means lightning. So its speed is such that its name is barak. And so when Jibreel al Islam comes, and of course Rasulullah is in the house of Ummihani, his, his cousin, 
who is the sister of Ali, he's sleeping there with his uncle Hamza. And we need to learn to question everything. And the question is, why is he sleeping there and not sleeping in his own house? And it's something most of us don't even think about. You know, okay, he's sleeping there. We don't think, okay, why is he sleeping there? If you remember to the, back, the background of this, three years, for the past three years, they had been boycotted. Quraysh, Quraysh had given Banu Hashim an ultimatum, hand him over or, you know, suffer the consequences. And it was very clear, hand him over so we can kill him. So that threat was still evident and even, or still valid. And for the past three years, his uncle, who had just passed away, did not allow him to sleep in his own house. Every night he would have him sleep somewhere else. And generally speaking, Ali Radim would be the one sleeping in his bed. So if they attacked, then Ali Radim would be there. Whereas Rasulullah would be sleeping somewhere else. So the threat is not gone. So still, he's not sleeping in his own house. He's sleeping various places. And that night, he happens to be in the house of Umm Hani. When Jibreel Islam arrives, you know, he finds Rasulullah sleeping. So now the question is, how does he wake him up? Everything happens according to the will of Allah. And every aspect, every breath, every aspect of the life of Rasulullah is for us to learn something from it. And every aspect of his being is so that we learn to honor and respect and learn his etiquette and adab of Rasulullah. Prophets never sleep. The hearts of the prophets never sleep. And this is general for all prophets. They are always aware of what's going on. Of what is going on with everyone in their jurisdiction. The jurisdiction of Rasulullah expands throughout the universe. And this is, the, this is not my saying as far as the hearts of the prophets never sleep. This is what Rasulullah himself said. You know, when the friend of Aisha Siddiqa came and was talking to her while Rasulullah was sitting or laying there snoring, sleeping and snoring. You know, he would snore not like, you know, not like many of us, you know, was, ah, you know, like a train rumbling. You know. But they described his snoring like, like I mean, to, where you could simply hear his breathing. It changed. And so after they had finished, and the friend left, and Rasulullah gets up and he tells Aisha Siddiqa everything that they had talked about. And she says, Ya Rasulullah, you were sleeping. And this is when he said that the hearts of the prophets, the, the eyes of the prophets sleep, but their hearts never sleep. And so when Jibreel comes, why doesn't Rasulullah simply get up? Why even create a situation where Jibreel Islam feels obligated to have to wake him up? Because again, it's to show the etiquette of the beloved of Allah. So how does Jibreel Islam wake him up? Uh, he doesn't come and, ah, you know, shake him and say, oh, get up. What does he do? He lays his eyes on the feet of Rasulullah. And the Rasulullah gets up. And he asks Jibreel, he says, what's going on? He again knows. This is so we know. And Jibreel says, Ya Rasulullah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has called you. So let's go. They come out, close the door, the chain is swinging, 
Rasulullah Sussan makes wudu. Gets on Burak, and as he, as he approaches Burak, Burak starts jumping up and down. And Jibreel Islam holds the reins of Burak and say, this, says, this is the messenger of Allah. So why is Barak jumping up and down? Mm -hmm. you know, why is he, uh, you know, it's not like he's an unbroken horse. You know, he's jumping up and down because now he, he realizes mm -hmm. the whole purpose of his creation mm -hmm. is that Rasulullah mm -hmm. may sit on him and the honor that they, this gives to that Barak. They go from Makkah, you know, as the verse says, Masjid al Haram ila al Masjid al Aqsa, to Masjid al Aqsa in Jerusalem. There are other things that happen on, along the way, but they arrive in Aqsa, and who is waiting for them there? All of the prophets. 124,000 plus or minus. All have the, of them have come. Most of them have come from their graves. Idris al Islam has come from paradise. Isa al Islam has come from the heavens. But they're all there. To have the honor of making salat behind their master, Sayyid al Anbiya, the master of the prophets. And he leads them in two rakat. There are many aspects that I'm skipping over and various aspects that I'm going to come back to later on, inshallah. From here, you know, the, the Barak was tied at the dome of the, what is known, now known as the dome of, dome of the rock. There's a rock there, that's where Barak was tied. Many people think, oh, that's Masjid al-Aqsa. That is not Masjid al-Aqsa. That's where Barak was tied. The Masjid is on the side. Rasulullah after leading all of these prophets in prayer, he gets on Barak, and now they go. And they arrive at the first heaven, the gate of the first heaven. And this gets confusing in English, because unfortunately many of us, you know, we, we, we synonymously use heaven and paradise. You know, here when we're talking about the heavens, we're talking about the layers of, of the universe. Paradise is Jannah, that is separate. So they get to the gate of the first heaven and stop. And Jibreel al Islam knocks on the gate. And the gatekeeper from inside asks, Who is it? And he says, Jibreel. And then he asks, He says, Who has come with you? He says, Muhammad. And he asks, he, Okay, fine, okay, he's come with you. He asks, Has he been sent for? You know, it's like, I want to go someplace. You know, it's one thing if I simply, you know, I want to go meet somebody. I get in my car and I go. Okay. You know, I knock on the door. He may not, he may open it, he may not open it. It's something else if he sends me an invitation. Now when I go, and if there's a gatekeeper, you know, I show them, oh, see, I got the invitation. They say, okay, yeah, come on in. It's totally different if along with the invitation, I also am sent the limousine and the chauffeur. This emphasizes, you know, how much the inviter wants to see the one that's been invited. invited. And so the gatekeeper, he asked, has he been sent for? And Jibreel Islam says, yes. And they open the gate. They welcome him. And who does he meet on the first heaven? Adam alayhi salam. Same thing happens at the second heaven. Same conversation. But then they open the gate. And there he meets Isa alayhi salam and Yahya alayhi salam. And then the third heaven, where he meets Yusuf alayhi salam. And then the fourth heaven, where he meets Idris alayhi salam. 
and then the fifth heaven where he meets Harun al Islam, and the sixth he meets Musa al Islam, and then on the seventh he meets Ibrahim al Islam. And when he enters the seventh, Ibrahim al Islam is sitting with his back to Baytul Ma'mur. Baytul Ma'mur, or rather, let me put it the other way. The Kaaba on this earth is a, is a reflection of Baytul Ma'mur in the heavens. Here on, on, at the Kaaba, we make tawaf. There in the heavens, the angels make tawaf. <coughs> so Ibrahim al-Islam is sitting with his back to Baytul Ma'mur with the gathering of children in front of him and he's teaching them the Quran. And these children are those children of the Ummah of Rasulullah Sallallahu who died in infancy. And he teaches them the Quran. Jibreel al Islam, you know, he's been, he's traveled this distance and all of, through the heavens multiple times. There's no mention of him ever stopping at any of the gates. When Yusuf al Islam was thrown in the well, Jibreel al Islam at that time was at Sidrat al Muntaha. We'll get into what Sidrat al-Muntaha is, but just think of it, Sidrat al-Muntaha has a general uh, description as the limit of creation, you know, the edge of creation. So this is where he was. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders him to catch Yusuf al-Islam, and for Yusuf al-Islam falls to the bottom of the well, Jibreel al-Islam catches him. No stopping, no discussion with anybody, back and forth. And yet now, when he is with the Messenger of Allah, Allah. وسلم, now he has to stop. Have this conversation, be questioned, okay, who are you? Why are you here? Who's with you? Why? And again, we have to understand, or at least have a glimpse of an understanding of who Rasulullah is. You know, there are certain protocols that are followed when you're dealing with someone very important. You go to any king's court, even in this world, you know, kings, <coughs> you know, kings are really a dime a dozen. You know, presidents, prime ministers, you know. but even when they enter the parliament, or enter their court, what happens? They stop at the gate and a man makes an announcement. Even though everybody knows who the king is. But this is protocol so everybody can get ready to follow him <coughs> and respect him as they should. And here in the heavens, all the angels and those prophets, as Rasulullah is traveling, as he comes, now they get ready and they honor him and respect him and show the, show the etiquette that they're supposed to show him. That's the whole purpose of this. The other thing that we don't think about is Idris al-Islam. You know, if you remember, Idris al-Islam is already in paradise. And we've talked about him before. In English, he's known as Enoch. You know, the angel came and he said, okay, take me around and show me how you take the soul out. And he took the soul out and put it back in. And then show me, uh, show me the fire. And they went over the fire and he said, I want to see paradise. And they enter paradise. And then the angel says to him, let's go. And Idris al -Islam says, I'm not going. So the angel goes to Allah and says, yeah, Allah, what's going on? He says, he's done everything according to my orders. And he says, Idris al -Islam, when he tells the angels, I'm not going, he says, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, nafs al maut, that every nafs, every soul will taste death. I've tasted it. Every soul will go over the fire. I've done that. And when a soul enters, or when one enters paradise, he doesn't come out. Hum fiha khalidun, forever. Hmm? So I'm not leaving. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the angel, he's done everything according to what I've ordered him to do. Yet, 
for this night, Idris al Islam leaves Jannah, one to come and pray behind a Rasulullah on the earth. And then instead of going back to Jannah immediately, he stops at the fourth heaven to meet Rasulullah again. Because he understands that the presence of Rasulullah is greater than Jannah, is greater than that physical Jannah. You know, his presence is in reality Jannah itself. You know, the lover always wants to be with the beloved. And these prophets are true lovers of Rasulullah. And they're teaching us the etiquettes of that love. The other thing to think about is, you know, Barak is traveling at the speed of sight, one foot as far as you can see. So Rasulullah is traveling on Barak, so he's traveling at the speed of Barak. He finished Salat in Masjid al-Aqsa, led all of the prayer, led all the prophets. He leaves before them. You know, because they see him off as he's leaving for the journey. And yet Adam al-Islam is already in the first heaven as Rasulullah Sussman is coming. And then, you know, as the others, they're all in their appropriate place. So what speed are they traveling with? And why even doing this? And the reality is that they are speed, traveling with the speed of love. That they want to honor Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi out of their love for him. Then, after this point, you know, after the seventh heaven, then Jibreel Islam takes Rasulullah on a tour of the fire. And Rasulullah he sees the, the hell with, with its inhabitants. You know, because there are people being punished and he asks Jibreel, who are these? And various people being punished in various ways and the questions and the various questions that he asked. Who are these? Who are these? And Jabil Islam answers, oh, these are those from, you know, who did this. You know, those who committed adultery or those who lied or those who drank and all of the various, you know, sins and people committed, you know, being punished for this. You know, the uh, judgment hasn't taken place. And yet he's seeing all of this. Same thing with Jannah. When he goes and tours Jannah, he sees, you know, the house of Omar. He sees various people, you know, being given various rewards. All the inhabitants, and again, you know, the judgment hasn't taken place. You know, for us, this is something of the future. For Allah, there is no past or future. Everything simply is. Time for Him has no meaning. Because time is His creation. He is not bound by time. And this is where Rasulullah says, Fear the sight of a mu'min. Because he sees through the nur of Allah. So this is the average mu'min, the average believer. What about the one whom because because of whom that moment became a moment? <coughs> By saying Muhammadur Rasulullah Wasallam, And not just simply saying it, but loving him as he says it. You know, average Joe Blow has now become a moment. 
And Rasulullah says, I'm saying that he sees with the nur of Allah. Nothing is hidden from the nur of Allah. So if this is the condition of the average mu'min, what can we say the condition of Rasulullah so some sight itself? So he's seeing all of this. And then they get to the end of Sidrat al-Muntaha. So to understand Sidrat al-Muntaha, Rasulullah Sassam describes Sidrat al-Muntaha and if you read the translation of it, they translate it as a loath, loath tree. It's a tree. And he said that its roots are in the sixth, are in the sixth heaven and its branches extend on to the limit of the seventh heaven. Its, its leaves are like the, like the, year, uh, like the uh, uh, ears of elephants. So it symbolizes the limit of creation, which is an interesting description because, again, it's a tree. What do trees do? They grow. Uh, what do we know today? That the universe is still expanding. It's still growing. The Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us this. So this is what this symbolizes. It's the end of creation, the limit of creation. So when they get to this point, you know, after, when they had gone to Jannah, Barak stayed in Jannah. Because the origin of Barak was Jannah. That's where it came from. Now, when they get to Sidrat al-Muntaha, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi continues the journey. Jibreel al-Islam stops. Because this is his limit. When Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi continues and Jibreel does not follow, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi says, Oh Jibreel, you know, what's wrong? Why don't you come? And he says, Ya Rasulullah, so, so this is this is my limit. If I go even a hair's width beyond this point, I will be annihilated. All of my wings will be destroyed. I will not exist anymore. Which is interesting because Mawlana Rumi Rahmatullah he uses this point. Because, you know, people come up with stupid arguments, and one of the arguments during his time that was going on is, who, who's greater, Abu Bakr or Jibreel? And Mawlana Rumi says, Abu Bakr, radiallahu Because Jibreel did not, go, did not continue with Rasulullah because of the excuse that he would die, that he would be, he would be destroyed. Whereas Abu Bakr, radiallahu on the on you know the the hijra when they immigrated from Mecca to Medina, when they are in the cave, and the snake tries to is about to bite him, and the snake tells him, "Move, otherwise I will bite you and you will die." He says, "What?" He says, "It doesn't matter if I die, but I will not leave Rasulullah." So now. We enter the realm of La Makkah, which means no place. Up to this point, you know, the journey was from place to place to place to place. And now, again, you know, and, and words can't describe it because how do you enter no place? Or how do you exit no place? You know, is there a right and a left in no place? Or an up and a down? There's no place. La Makan. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be confined to a place. There is no here or there for Allah. Again, He simply is. And so when He entered the or when when you leave creation, there's simply Allah. Time's up. Yeah, took longer than I thought. But read 
even with what we've talked about today, go back, read the first verse, first verse of Surah Isra, Surah number 17, and the first 18 verses of Surah <coughs> Najm, okay, 53. Uh, and start pondering over them with this understanding of what we're talking about, because those, those verses deal with this journey. And if you think about them outside of the journey, then you can't understand them. You know, you have to understand them in the context of the journey itself. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand uh, and fill our hearts with His true love and the true love of His beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, His family, His companions, and all of those whom they love, inshallah. Those who have not made sunnah go and make sunnah, inshallah.